Morning, everyone. Bonjour. <laughs> Welcome to the next installment of the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series that take place here at the Indurpilly Lecture Theater and online, as is the case today. Uh, my name is Katerina, and myself and Karina are co-chairs of organizing the seminar series and are taking turns introducing the speakers this year. So before we start, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands of which we all meet today. So here in Brisbane and, um, and in Canada, uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize our valuable contributions to Australian and global society. It is a real pleasure to host and introduce our speaker today, um, who is Dr. Guy Desharnay, who is the Vice President of Project Evaluation at Cisco Gold Royalties in Montreal, Canada, from where he's joining us via Zoom today. So thank you for taking the time out of your evening. A um, bit more info about Guy. Um, so after completing his PhD in geochemistry and igneous petrology, he started his career as an exploration geologist with Extrata Nickel before transitioning to consulting work. Um, he then managed uh, the SGS Geostat team for several years, working on a wide range of projects internationally, from resource estimations to economic evaluations, metallurgical sample selection, geomet studies, um, all the way through to audits of resource and reserves, uh, to name a few things. Uh, he was also named Distinguished Lecturer by the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum back in 2017. And in addition to his current role as the Vice President um, of Project Evaluation, he is also an active member of the Mining Technical Advisory and Monitoring Committee for the Canadian Securities Administrators. And today's presentation is titled, How Cognitive Biases Are Crippling the Mining Industry. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, switch to my presentation. Uh, All right, well, thanks. So, so, so sorry, Guy, uh, I just wanted to say, um, to welcome um, everyone to write questions in the chat. So we do have some people in the, um, in the lecture theater, but encouraging people to, uh, to write questions directly in the chat. Thank you. Okay, and, and you can see my screen? And we can see your screen, yes. Perfect. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, as, as the introduction uh, uh, proposed, I am a, a geologist and uh, I'm quite uh, quite an optimist. Parts of this presentation are quite cynical about the industry and, and I, uh, I, I'm not always such a negative person, uh, but I think uh, the industry needs to sort of take a hard look at itself uh, Particularly in, in the junior junior exploration space and and the mine development space, uh, because we're seeing uh, an overabundance of destruction of capital in the industry. Uh, in Canada right now, there are two projects in construction that are have blown out their capex by almost double or more than double. So uh, you know we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars beyond what was estimated in the feasibility study, and that's just one example. We've we've seen other things in in Canada and Australia and around the world. And a lot of these factors are based on, on human factors. And I always sort of come back to, you know, how are these people uh, that are ex executing these studies or managing these companies coming to, to these conclusions? And that's sort of uh, how, how I got to, uh, to, to bring this subject forward. And my job as uh, VP of project evaluation is to find good projects and find the dogs that don't merit uh, our investment. And the more quickly I can find those projects that are dogs, uh, the better we can focus our, our attention on, um, on those projects that, that merit uh, investment. So sometimes it's easy to spot the dogs and other times it's, it's more difficult. I did a compilation of, and this is based, based on my, my expectation, but I, I did a compilation of IRRs, which is a, a measure of profitability of mining projects from, from feasibility studies. And that's the histogram we see on the right here. And on the left, we see an octopus that's sort of deforming itself to try to achieve the, the minimum threshold of profitability, which appears to be from this graph around 15 or 20% of IRR to, to be a viable, respected project. Uh, and there's many ways to achieve that, that threshold. 
Uh, obviously, some of these are, are don't belong in the, the group of profitable projects as we see in the, uh, the actual uh, results in the industry. Um, and oftentimes when projects fail, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the management of, of the failing companies will often point to the underlying geology and, and call it an act of God. So this is a, uh, a signpost in, in Colombia that I came across. It basically says, uh, dangerous zone, in unstable geology, as if the rocks are responsible for the bad road design. So a human decided to put a road here and, and decided what safety factors are required to, to ensure the safety of this road. It's not really the rock's fault, it's, it's basically the, the human's fault. And in the industry, uh, we see lots of, there's lots of sources of errors and this is, I'm just gonna go through the, the, the workflow of the most common case of, uh, of major issues I see. And this is more specifically to, to gold deposits. And gold deposits in particular are, are, in particular are prone to nugget effect. Uh, that's, that's fairly obvious. And you need a certain amount of drilling to sort of to outline and, and get a better understanding of what the controls on mineralization are for these types of deposits. Uh, oftentimes we hear in, uh, or we can read in the technical reports uh, that the ore zones are very hard to, to, to create an, a very airtight ore solid, which is a very important step in mineral resource estimation, because if you mix uh, two different populations of, of data together, then you, you're, you're sort of handcuffed to, to fail throughout the rest of the workflow. So we see uh, fairly, um, fairly often projects where they'll, they'll, they'll attempt to make a, a nice ore solid and they'll fail and they'll say, well, we'll just make a big, big balloon over the whole thing and say that the ore, bo ore body is discontinuous inside here, but I'm, this is the best I can do. The two histograms here, the, the top one is for mineralized intervals, or you can think of it as raw assays. And this is fairly typical for, for gold deposits. We have a lot of zero values and you have a long tail of, of very high values. Through the process of resource estimation, uh, generally speaking, you're, you're doing, the mechanism is making averages. So the blocks are looking for data around it. We'll take an average of data around it. And that deforms the distribution of, of the data. So as a, all these zeros that we saw in this upper histogram are sort of squashed down, the tail is squashed in and we were, looks like we're trying to make a, a bell curve or a normal curve. What this does, this action, it actually uh, creates a lump of blocks or volume that, that is forced across the cutoff grade. So when we're reporting resource estimations, we only report the part that's above a, an economic cutoff grade. Everything below is, is immaterial. But the fact that we're doing averages of this log, log normal distribution, we're sort of like pushing and forcing some of that material above that cutoff grade. And because we violated the first law of geostatistics, which is you need to only be looking at a, a population of data, which is internally consistent, then the variography and all the geostatistics that we think we can do after that are, are, are relatively garbage. Uh, this is a, a real variogram that was used for a real resource estimation. It has a range of 400 meters, which is bonkers, ridiculous, completely useless. But this was used to, to estimate the, the risk on the resource and actually uh, apply a classification, which was uh, overly optimistic. So this workflow, unfortunately, is fairly common in, in the gold resource estimation uh, world. And if, if I can catch a few people on, on this, it will be uh, very useful. Um, and most ore deposits live within this chart. Um, and generally speaking, when people are applying risk or discussing risk about resource estimation, uh, they're mostly talking about and measuring grade unpredictability. And we have very good tools on this, real geostatistical tools. We can do uh, simulations and, and other tools that we can use to estimate what the risk is on, on, this, on this axis. But in terms of the geometrical unpredictability, it's very difficult to estimate this, especially if you have insufficient drilling. And the majority of, of the 4,000 uh, uh, junior exploration companies that are on the, the Toronto Stock Exchange or the Australian Stock Exchange are looking for these types of deposits, which are, which are very discontinuous in their geometry. And they need a lot of drilling to sort of support uh, those 
um, resource classifications. And what works on these deposits uh, will not will not give you a good risk evaluation on, on these deposits. So I'll just describe you a, a real case study. Um, this is, a, I changed the wording a little bit so you won't be able to find what project it is, but it's fairly recent economic evaluation. Uh, so this is, is uh, taken from the technical report. So gold grade has a skewed distribution where the very high grade component is proportionally low in number. Mineralization tends to occur as thin, discontinuous sheets of lenses of mineralization, individual lenses of gold mineralization pinch and swell, which makes modeling the zones exceedingly difficult. Dozens of attempts of automating wireframe construction were not satisfactory. So just reading those points, you're like, okay, well, this, is a, this is a dangerous report. It's very uh, dangerous deposit, it's very risky. So we're gonna need more drilling. Uh, we're gonna try very hard to respect the volume. So when we're estimating ore and waste in the block model, we should make sure that from the drilling to the blocks is sort of that ratio is more or less respected. Uh, we know the geostatistics are gonna be unreliable based on the descriptions of the deposit. Uh, we need to be very conservative on capping based on the description. And we need to have a sanity check on the mineable shapes. So mining engineers mine rectangles. They don't mine squiggly things that are discontinuous. So after we've done the estimation, the mining engineer needs to go back and look at you know, what, what can be observable. What's a, what's a mineable shape in here? And what is a realistic uh, dilution or loss for that scenario? What we get instead is is a, is a crap sandwich, which <laughs> unfortunately is not, uh, I'm sorry for the image, but it's, it's, it's very telling. Uh, so they used 80, more than 80 grams per ton capping. There's no real ore model. So there was no attempt to be like, this domain is waste, we need to extract it. And they use a drill spacing, which, which in my opinion is, is far too wide to, to, to define and have a, a reasonable risk around with the resource estimation results. So the people that did this work, they're not evil people. They're not bad people. They're professionals. They're from a company that's respected. So I come back to the question of like, what brings these humans to make assumptions that are misfit with their own description and their own knowledge about the ore body? And the reason, and I discovered this accidentally, I'm not a psychologist, obviously, is, is there's a whole uh, research branch, which is called cognitive uh, science. And the cognitive bias is a systematic error in thinking that occurs when people are processing and interpreting information uh, in the world around them. And there's literally hundreds of examples of this. And if you want to go down a rabbit hole, uh, just Google it and Wikipedia, uh, you, you can pick and find ones that are most um, closely related to your field of study or your current situation. But I picked uh, just a few that I think are really particularly relevant to the problem I see in the industry and uh, sort of give examples where, where I think uh, it's having an impact on the mining industry. So the first one, and I think this is the most important for, uh, for the junior exploration companies is uh, the IKEA effect. So the IKEA effect speaks to how we tend to like, to like things more if we've expended effort to create them. So the, the, if you go to, to a garage sale and you see an Ikea table, you're like, this is, I, know, <laughs> I know how much this costs. I know what it is, it's chipped or whatever. You think it has X value, but the person who actually built it thinks it's, it's worth more. Um, and so I, have, I came across this, this uh, great profile of, of Anuba Rafayan, who, who is a serial entrepreneur, uh, who is looking to create um, moonshot ideas, so high risk, high reward companies. And once he finds a good idea, he, he rounds up some experts and those experts are, their, their task is to tell him why his idea does, won't work. So he was looking to make an mRNA vaccine and the experts told him, um, this won't work because the body will reject it. This won't work because there's no way to mass produce mRNA and this won't work because you need to fold the mRNA in a very specific way and there's, there's no tool to do that. So he said, okay, that's fine. I've got those problems. He started a small company. Uh, he called it LS18. It was Life Sciences 18. He refused to give it a real name and he tried to kill it. You know, Through the process of trial and error and looking out for what are the tools that could solve his problem, he actually eventually realized, okay, this is actually a real company and 
I can make this work. So we changed the name from LS18 and, and it's, it's Moderna. This is completely backwards from how junior mining exploration companies work. Junior mining exploration company finds a project that they think has a potential to, to, to host an ore deposit. They give it a, a fancy name that's a Greek god or an animal or something cute that they can hang on to, make a beautiful shiny website, uh, get their friends and family to invest, and then they'll do whatever they can for the for the remaining life of this company to make it survive and find ways to finance it and keep it coming and move it forward and, and not, not let it uh, die a horrible death. So I, I previously worked in exploration for Falcon Ridge, which, which became Extrata and uh, Glencore. And then in the mind, mindset of that company, which had you know 30 year uh, history before is, we need to find what they call the Falcon Ridge class deposit. And for nickel, it was 20 million tons of 2% nickel. So the smart geological minds would get together and be like, we need a large igneous province with ultramafic rocks, do geophysics, find a target. And then eventually they drill a hole, a very good nickel hole. And then they, what the next step is, okay, can we make this work? They draw six holes around it, 150 meter step outs. And if none of them hit, then it's impossible to fit. 20 million tons of 2%. Let's take our money, the remaining expiration budget, and spend it elsewhere because we know this one cannot provide us what we want. And there's not enough of that type of thinking of, you know, let's spend the capital where, where it has most value in the industry. Um, the next bias is uh, authority bias or courtesy bias. It's a very polite Canadian version of authority bias. Um, the tendency to attribute greater weight to the opinion of an authority figure. And the example, the first example here is not a mining example. It's a, a plane crash uh, that occurred at JFK. It's a, it's a Colombian airline plane, uh, Avianca 052. And it's described in great detail in a book uh, and YouTube videos. If you Google this, you'll find it by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. And the book is called Outliers. And it's a, it's a beautiful microcosm of this, this, this bias. So um, Colombia is known to be a very uh, um, hierarchical society. You respect the supervisors, the elders, you do not question and you, you, you stay timid and quiet until you're given permission to speak. Um, and if, if you're like me, a, a little bit of a fan of, of these, these uh, documentaries of, about disasters, almost all of them end up being a multiple factors occurring at the same time to sort of coordinate to, to create these disasters. And this is not an exception. So first of all, it was bad weather. Uh, they had very low fuel and the pilots were tired just from other circumstances. The co-pilot was very timid. And when he requested, when he talked to the, uh, to the, to the very rough, and rough New Yorker uh, traffic control attendant, uh, he didn't make clear that they were dangerously uh, low on fuel and they needed to be at the front of the line. So the, the traffic control did not understand the, the level of emergency. And the co and the, the main pilot was so tired, he was basically useless and wasn't really aware that the, the level of danger they were in. And the co-pilot didn't take, didn't raise his voice and say, this is a serious situation, you need to take control. Uh, and basically by the time he figured it out, it was, it was too late. Um, and obviously the, 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 the plane crashed just a few kilometers from, 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 uh, from landing at JFK, which is a terrible tragedy. So in the mining example of this is, you know, the mining manager is not listening to the smart technical experts in his group uh, because he's strong-minded. He loves his, his project named after a Greek god and, and the, the the, the smart experts are not really stepping up and speaking loudly and, and, and speaking against him. Uh, and in a, in a case where it's consultants and clients, it's even worse. There's a huge power divide between the consultants who need to please the client to make sure they get future projects and, and they wanna have a good relationship with the clients. Uh, and oftentimes those managers of the projects, the CEO or the president are very strong, strong-willed people and, and, and think we can bully the assumptions that we want to apply and we, we can negotiate and find things that are, are gonna make our project look uh, more economic. 
Commitment bias is another um, important one. It's the tendency to keep to commitments to avoid reputational damage. An example in exploration is you have a budget for 15 drill holes. Uh, you drew, you drill the first couple, and then you realize this is this is our, our geological model for this does not work. And maybe instead of saying, you know, we're going to stop it after two holes, we're going to take this money, we're going to spend it on a new target, or we're going to like find a new deposit or just hold on to the money. The tendency is to like, you know, let's let's do what we said we were going to do, regardless of, of lack of uh, support for that. And I'm sorry for people here who have young girls at home. Now you have a, this song stuck in your head. The compromise effect is a tendency to choose the middle option. So if you've ordered wine in a restaurant, you probably don't end up buying the, the cheapest or the most expensive bottle. You'll, you'll, the, the restaurant specifically designs the wine list to have the bottle they actually wanna sell you, one or two bottles below the most expensive one. And this happens all the time when we're making resource uh, estimations or economic evaluations of mining projects. There's a multitude of, of different assumptions that we can use. And the, the CEO will often look at a certain number of those assumptions and be like, I think it's cheaper. The mining cost is cheaper than what you're showing. Can we go somewhere in between? And often the, 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 the expert or the consultant will, will, will placate and be like, okay, fine, we'll, we'll pick somewhere in the middle. And if you do one or two of those, it's not so bad. But what happens when you're changing several assumptions at the same time, some of them will build off of each other and create a, a much more uh, exponential change in the project economics. And the simplest example is uh, when you're doing a, a, a pit optimization, if you change uh, the metal price and the mining cost, and the GNA, then all of a sudden the pit can get a lot bigger. Then you can change the size of your processing plant, which brings that cost down, and things can build off each other and, and, and really create something that, that is not uh, viable. The street light effect occurs when people only search for something where it's the easiest to look. So here the police officer says, uh, this, is, this is where you lost your wallet. And this poor fellow here says, no, I lost it in the park, but this is where the light is. And in mining example, um, there's a few, I have a few examples here. So the first one, this is a, a long section on a gold deposit in Canada called Beza. Uh, it's color coded for gray below the cutoff grade here, which is three and red above the cutoff grade. And then in the, in the central image here, it's a cutoff grade of four and a cutoff grade of five on the right. So you can see the, the change in the amount of blocks that are above that cutoff grid. So usually people come to a project and say, oh, I've worked at a gold deposit before. The cutoff we used was five grams per ton. So they try to force their economic assumptions on the deposit and try to make it do something that it, it cannot do. And you can see the continuity of the mineralization sort of decrease and degrade to, to the point where it's totally shredded here. So. Again, if you're mining, you're making rectangles, and if you try to start making rectangles around these shapes, then you're gonna create a huge amount of uh, dilution and you're not gonna have a good result. Whereas if you look at this deposit and you say, geologically, this deposit can, can provide me a fairly consistent, easy to mine shape uh, if we look at it as a three gram per ton deposit, and then you say, let's test it all the way to the end. Can we make money with this thing? And you have to be ready to accept that maybe this deposit is not economic at the current uh, prices and you put it on the shelf for, for a few years. Another example of the street light effect uh, is a lot of the exploration expenditures are done where we have good, ex good outcrop exposure uh, near existing mines. So there's a, there's a few examples of, of companies that are working uh, hard to find deposits under underneath cover. Here's just an example in Australia called Falcon Metals. Uh, they picked up a huge amount of ground here, and they're 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 looking for uh, for mineralization similar to to Fosterville. Um, obviously, it's more expensive to do work there, but if you're looking for something new uh, and world class, and you're you're giving yourself a chance to to discover something there. And in Canada, we have uh, Canorland, which is 
uh, picks up huge swaths of greenstone belts that are covered in till, uh, glacial till, and they, they, they spend a lot of money drilling the till samples and trying to find trends in the data to, to identify new mineral deposits. The anchoring effect is an individual's decisions are, are influenced by a particular reference point, regardless of whether it is valid. Uh, this is an example of a gold mine in Canada. Uh, four successive resource estimations and the histogram and the numbers here are all uh, ounces uh, of total resources. Uh, the first resource estimation was done by uh, a competent, per well, an incompetent person in this case because he he was not, uh, she should not have attempted to make a resource estimation and, and now he's discredited with a few other projects. Um, so he, the result was four million ounces. In 2011, a reputable three-letter consulting firm uh, did an updated resource and they lost over a million ounces of resources here, um, but still uh, retained a huge resource. In 2013, a separate three-letter consulting firm uh, following tens of kilometers of drilling, redid the estimation, again, dropped the resources. So between this estimation and this estimation, I'm quite certain that the president and CEO of this, this company was very adamant that, that his, his job and his future and the project's future was in jeopardy because they were being so mean to him and cutting his resources, even though they invested a whole bunch of money in drilling. Um, so they were able to raise $400 million to build the mine, build a processing plant and get underground. And once they got underground, they realized that the gold was not where they thought it was. They stopped the project. Uh, they went back and redid a new resource estimation and got to a result of 400,000 ounces. So they dropped this initial estimation was overestimated by 900%, which is, which is crazy, but this first estimation was definitely used as a reference point for everybody who came afterwards and sort of had this number that they were trying to live up to. And among all the other factors which, which are compounded uh, in this project, uh, this is one that I think was sort of uh, underappreciated. Survivorship bias uh, is drawing conclusions from an incomplete set of data because that data has a survived some selection criteria. So this image pops up on LinkedIn about every two weeks. Uh, it's a uh, World War II war, uh, bomber plane. And there was a, an engineer who was charged to figure out what was the best location to in increase the armor on this, uh, on this bomber plane. So we started looking at all the bullet holes of the planes that were, were coming back uh, from duty and he made a nice plot. And so the, the first reaction of many people is, well, obviously we need to add armor where the bullet hole map is, but in reality is the exact opposite. So he's, the planes that are coming back are the planes that survived. The planes that got a bullet through the cockpit or in the motors or in the tail section did not come back. And that, that's the real data that he should be uh, compiling and figuring out. So the, the armor should be going in these pieces where, where there are no bullet holes. And a very good example of this is uh, uh, I encountered, I, when I worked in consulting, I was working for SGS, which has a lot of uh, labs, metallurgical labs and assay labs in Canada and Australia. And uh, often we would get clients that have very high grade uh, samples with, with uh, visible gold. And maybe sometimes those came back with low assay grades and they would be like, I, I feel like I'm getting ripped off. Like the assay lab is stealing gold from me. What I want to do is screen metallics. So a screen metallics assay, essentially they crush and grind the material and they screen off and, and capture the, the nuggets and then back calculated and re-added into the assay. So this is a just a graph, it's, it's just a cartoon obviously of cumulative frequency. So essentially you take every single assay and you put it in order of increasing value. The black line is the exact pure real value but that value, the actual assay value you get back is quite a bit different than that and lives within, within a given range because there's, there's errors in sampling, there's errors in sample preparation, there's errors in the assay method. And so it lives within, within a, a fairly wide range, especially for, for gold. 
So what tends to happen is the, this client who says, I'm getting ripped off, where's my gold, goes back to his core and he grabs the, the, the best 1,000 or 100 samples that he has given a, a specific criteria. So in this case, he says, go back and grab any sample above 10 grams per ton. But by doing so, he or she is, is creating, uh, taking several samples that were lucky in being above above their real natural true value. And the most likely result of, of a large portion of this, this new sample will resample at a lower grade. So then it causes pandemonium because the client says, oh my God, like, are my old assays any good? Are my new assays good? What's going on? And it's just simply a factor of applying this, this survivorship bias, applying an artificial cutoff. And we see effects like this in resource estimation, uh, when we apply cutoff grade or capping or other factors in, in that process. Framing effect is uh, presenting the same outcome as a loss has a greater impact, psychological, uh, greater psychological impact than presenting it as a gain. Some of you are old enough to remember when McDonald's tried to feed us a diet, <laughs> diet burger for about six months before they realized people didn't go to McDonald's to lose weight. Uh, but they, they struggled with how to present the, 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 the diet burger as either 9% fat, which seems disgusting, or 91% fat-free, which seemed somehow acceptable. Um, and, and, as, and a super example here is NPV is net present value. So it's essentially the, the value, it's, it's, a, it's a measure of profitability. So you take the, uh, the profits in every year, you remove all the costs in every year, and then you discount it for time. And that's like the value that people decide whether or not to invest in a project or not. So in this case here, the, 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 the single value of the NPV maybe was you know, $80 million. And that's usually in the press release, that's what people bring to the bank and say, my project will make $80 million, please invest in me. Um, but in reality, what, what I think we should be doing is looking at these, these project outcomes and evaluating each one of the assumptions that go into that uh, economic valuation. So what's the error, what's the potential error upside, downside of resource estimation? metallurgical recovery, uh, ore loss, ore dilution in the mining, uh, the capital expenditures, the OPEX, the diesel price, which now is double what it was you know, two months ago, uh, the commodity price, and, and build, build in a, a more sophisticated uh, model of those. And some of those, so if some of those have links between them, so for example, if the ore grade goes up, then usually the metallurgical recovery goes up. So those are links. We need to sort of think about all these different factors that impact themselves. And then the result is not, instead of a single number, which is $80 million, we have a, a distribution of possible outcomes. And part of that distribution is negative. So there's a 20.6% chance that this project loses money, which is the main reason why people don't do this because they don't want to ever go to a bank and say, I need 20 million, I need, I need $100 million to build this mine and there's a 20% chance I'll, I'll lose everything. Well, actually the bank might be happy with that because I mean, they'll take your asset as a, as a liability. Um, but yeah, so I think this would be really interesting to see more, more and more people uh, think of their, their projects in terms of this risk matrix and, a, and distribution of possible outcomes. So the possible solutions, um, first of all, we need to understand that we are not rational. If you just set your brain as in like, yeah, I'm making a decision and you know, like, I'm not rational. What are the factors that are affecting my decision? Uh, we need to question our motivations. Are we just trying to get out of this conference room? Are we trying to make our, our, boss, our boss or our client happy? And particularly slow down when we're selecting the assumptions. Some of these, these basic assumptions that that we make get carried through step after step after step all the way through to uh, engineering design and, and construction and they can have a major impact on, on the projects. Uh, these are some of uh, recent books that I've read that are, that are if you're in, interested in this kind of uh, uh, way of thinking, they're super useful to sort of frame your brain and, and change the way you're thinking about uh, projects. So that's it. Thank you very much. I mean, we're right now in Canada. We're we're reviewing the the, the Canadian version of Jork, which is uh, National Instrument Forty Three One Hundred One. We're making recommendations, and we might make uh, some changes. Uh, it's super difficult to make recommendations around this cognitive impacts because it's hard to make people 
hard to make laws to change the way people think. Uh, but if anyone has any ideas that would be useful to, to help us uh, improve the mining industry, I'd be really, really happy to hear your ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. I don't know if you heard that, but there was clapping in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I got the tail end of it. Yes. Thank you. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, we do have questions online popping in already. And we have a question in the audience. Thank you. Should I wait for the online one or can I go ahead? Hi. Okay. Hi, Guy, Andre here. Uh, been a while since we caught up. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I guess um, it was interesting because you engaged me to look at some of these, um, but I find it fascinating, uh, I guess, because you and I both know that block caves particularly are very vulnerable to a lot of this, right? And uh, But I just wanted to make a, a point, well, and, and ask your opinion is that, um, uh, you know, you mentioned the different types of biases and, and, and uh, it's fascinating. But what I see a lot of in the caves is not so much that the engineers are screwing up in terms of, it's, well, I, I guess there's always a bit of that in the geologists, but there's a lot of pressure, you know, so when you're talking about commitment biases and, and anchoring effects and so on, uh, a lot of the time the, the um, uh, obviously, people want to put a lipstick on a pig to get the <laughs> to get it to get finance, but the the commitments to government make it uh, very difficult to go back and redo the, uh, the the models to and write off all this money, right? And there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, uh, I guess people's credibility on the line. So I've been in cases where people don't want to do that because they see themselves as the CP and they're losing credibility and and all this type of thing. So it's a very complex program, and and I'm I'm encouraged to hear what you're doing in Canada. And by the way, Australia is doing it in Jork as well. So maybe if they're not talking, they really should be talking because they're both redoing Jork. And I think the way it was going was. Um, uh, to rely more on a multidisciplinary approach where we've got engineers, geotechnical engineers, and so on, instead of just one CP. Um, I'd be interested to hear where you guys are going and, and what you think of that. Um, there's a lot there. I'd like to, uh, to start by saying when the commitment bias often leads to to uh, another another bias, which is the sunk sunk cost fallacy. So once you've started down a road and you've spent a few hundred million dollars, and the money you've spent no longer matters for the decision going forward, and you can do that several times and continue, even though if you look backwards, the project doesn't make sense. But as you as as long as you keep looking forward, it it it, it is more economic to continue and complete the project than it is to go back. So in the cases where you've committed to the government or the local community. Uh, there's also the, the economic commitment to, to continue all the way through. Uh, in terms of what, what's on, on the, the, the list for NA43-101, so now it's in the consultation period. Uh, it's extremely broad. Uh, there's a big section on uh, environmental, social, and governance, how much should be included, how much should the, the, the QPs and, and or competent persons should have responsibility to describe what are the, the community risks or the governance risk for a given jurisdiction. So uh, things like that are, are really hard to, to deal with. Uh, and there are specific questions about uh, CapEx estimations and resource estimations and, and uh, the reliability of, of uh, scoping studies and preliminary economic assessments. Uh, so they're, they're, they've, they've zoomed way out and they're looking for, for, for a lot of new information uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing. And in terms of the interconnection between Jork and NA43-101, there, excuse me, there there is a uh, an international uh, regulatory committee which is very unofficial, but they're trying to get all of these uh, uh, commi uh, committees to have similar rules, so so there's better translation between the different jurisdictions. So yeah, I'm hopeful that that there'll be some improvements there. But it's again, it's a lot of the problems are with humans and humans are hard to make laws around. So we'll see how, how things pan out. 
All right, we have quite a few questions online, so I'll read them out to, to those who cannot see, and you can probably uh, pull them up um, to, and follow along. But we actually have a raised hand from, from Rick. Rick, would you like to go ahead? Oh, yeah, thanks, Katerina, and, and thanks to you. That was a really, really interesting talk. It was interesting for me because I've lived a lot of the good and bad of what you've talked about. <laughs> what I want to say is that the companies I was running, one of them, one of them was named um, after a beach in Sydney, um, and and uh, another one was named after a wine bar in Adelaide. So so we didn't get to the Greek gods. I just wanted to put that one out there. But um, the 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 impetus for a lot of companies doing what they do, in particularly in the junior space, is pretty. Um, is pretty complex sometimes, I think. So, I, I, you know, I was thinking of, of uh, you showed the example of a company making a decision to not go ahead with a program because of early results. And I literally remember standing on a project in, next to Great Bear Lake in the Northwest Territories where we'd spent $200,000 flying in fuel and a helicopter and everything and going around to the various places we were going to drill. It was the first, place, first time I visited the project. Um, and calling the CEO of the company on the sat phone and saying, is there some way we can not do this program? <laughs> this project is a complete dog. And uh, it was at the start of the uranium boom and we drilled a whole bunch of doggy holes and we had one interval at one meter, one meter at 1% uranium and the market cap of the company went up by $300 million. Um, so I guess my, my point is that understanding the, the, the sort of thinking behind and the impetus of, of different companies is a, is a little bit complex. Um, and then the, the only other thing I wanted to mention was, um, do you think that there's any scope? One thing I thought of at, at some point was, do you think that there's any scope for some sort of system where um, invest, investing, you know, where, where um, funds, investment funds or or other people that are judging whether to invest in a company can get a, um, you know, some way that they can get an independent evaluation of a, of a resource in the way that you were talking about, where, where um, you know, somehow th they can actually have, have a, a, an independent measure of the risks associated with the resource. Like, you know, th this resource, if a thousand different people went in and estimated it, they'd come up with the same answer. And this resource is uh, is is completely aspirational, um, and I thought if there was a if somebody could come up with a way to do that, they could really get around a lot of this. So, so, so uh, that's three questions to zero. I'm not sure. Where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, I'll just take that last one because we're that this is something that I've I've discussed and proposed previously, and I think even just the threat that someone will pre peer review your your work is maybe enough. To, to make people change their assumptions. And, and even worse than that, even forcing the, the qualified persons or competent persons to describe very specifically what they did, what the drill spacing is to make a histogram and, and compare it to industry standards would be like, make them uncomfortable enough to re-question what they're doing. So insisting on a peer review in, in terms of uh, in the law is, I think is going to be very hard because it's costly for the junior companies. Uh, I know I ragged on the junior companies on, quite a bit on this, on this talk, as well as the consultants. And I've lived in those worlds and like within my, my company, we have several junior companies. So I'm not anti that I'm not anti the system. I just trying to improve things. But yeah, peer, I think peer review is, is an important aspect that the peer reviewer as well is, is being paid to look look for mistakes. So it's a totally different game. Their mindset is like, my, six, my, my client will be disappointed if I find no mistakes. So it's like, you're, 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 it's, it's hard because it's conflict and humans don't like conflict, but that could be a way to, to force people to be more, question themselves more as they're, they're going through the processes. But thanks for that question, Rick. Thanks. I think we have a similar question here. Um, so I'll start um, addressing the questions uh, in the chat and the Q&A box. So from Ariana Ford, um, how much of this is being fully aware 
of the issues that exist and just pretending they don't because you don't want to annoy investors in the project? Uh, most of this is, is unknown. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's worse than that in that after a project fails, there's almost never a postmortem to discover what the root causes are and avoid it happening again. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, my job is to go through these things and find the mistakes. So I'm the peer reviewer going through and, and looking for, for problems and, and I rarely come out the other side saying, oh, this is better than, better than, than displayed. So, um, yeah, it's, it's always the, the rosiest picture possible that's, that's front facing towards the investors. And, and it's, it's hard for, to identify what, what are the, the, uh, the really quality projects out there. And similarly, Lisa Forbes is asking, the concept of clients expecting the assumptions to be negotiable hits very close to home. Do you have any suggestions as to how to manage and counter it? Uh, it's very difficult. And, and I'll give you one, one example. We had a, a president say like, okay, well, if, if we have to put out this resource you put out, then I'm going to lose my job. And it's not, it's not a threat to the, to the consultant, but you're like, geez, I don't want to have this this person that I care about that gave me this work to lose their job, like, but like we we want to help these people. It's 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 extremely difficult to do, and and I I'm looking for solutions myself because there's a huge uh, the, the the power the power balance is is off there between clients and consultants, and it's it's hard to to find a balance. Recently, just this past week, uh, uh, a titan in the industry just passed away. Uh, Mr. Farquharson was was. The, the person who discovered uh, the Briex scandal, which was the Indonesian gold deposit that uh, was there and was, was the utmost of, of uh, reliability and, and uh, morality. And, and it's, it's a great loss for the industry, but people, people like that who will stand up to, to, uh, to their, their clients. When you went to that company and you hired that person, you knew you were getting the, the straight the straight truth and there's there's value to do work with with companies that have that level of reputation so yeah it's a hard problem paul gal is saying thanks Guy. great talk uh what do you think are the solutions for the mining industry education or inclusion in mandatory reporting codes or other approaches uh, I think you can you can only solve so much with uh, reporting codes. Uh, simple simple examples that would 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 increase. I think the reliability of, of reporting is is asking to describe, like for example, the showing a long section of the mineralization and the drill hole intersection, so that people can look at the drill spacing. Uh, that that's a simple thing that we can do, but it only goes part way. Training, I think, is is really important, but it's uh, really hard uh, to uh, like who who would describe what the training is. There's huge different schools of thought: the uh, French Geostat school versus the uh, uh, the, the the Canadian uh, Common Sense school. I mean, there's uh, different ways to look at the project to to that problem and, and come out with a curriculum that that serves that perfectly. Um, but yeah, it's a combination. And I think like just these discussions and general awareness uh, by, by the industry, I think is, is going in that direction. And then Herbert Todd is saying, thanks for the presentation as well. Would it be helpful if exploration is government funded so that the people involved are not driven financially, but rather focused on reality without repercussion? No, I don't like that idea. I, I, I like I, I like I like uh, public financing of 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 exploration. I think that's an eff an efficient way to raise money. I, I already pay too many taxes in in Canada, and it it would not promise a more efficient use of those funds. Uh, I think I'd rather have people choose to do it. I think in a in a in a capitally efficient market, then the money should go towards the, the, the teams that do good work and discover and develop good projects. So uh, natural selection should, should go through and, and, and work its magic uh, and the money should be going to the more deserving projects. 
And then Fernando Vieira is, uh, it's, I guess it's more of a comment. Uh, would there be an added effect, perhaps an overarching one, that derives from multiple constraints related to the subjectiveness of theories, conjectures, processes, archetypes, models, data processing schemes, very tools, some with incompatible computational constructs, pointing to a need to derive global acceptance standards. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has a thesaurus. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the question there. The, the, uh, the, I don't think we can solve uh, these, these human interactions with, with uh, any algorithms or software or compilations. I, I think education, like getting people to understand the, the trappings and, and getting them to, uh, to see them and, and avoid them, I think is the, the most useful uh, use of, of, of energy. So the next one is from Carlos Jimenez. Um, great talk, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Big fan of Malcolm Gladwell and revisionist history here too. Also Colombian and also an explorer. <laughs> I often talk about bias and distance to power to the groups I work with, very often about the Avianca and South Korean disasters. On our defense, not all Colombians are like the Avianca co-pilot, but we certainly rank high in the distance to power dimension. I really like the way you highlighted the importance of lateral thinking and the examples you provided. <laughs> it's uh it's uh, the the i agree i love colombia i spent a lot of time there people there are amazing and it's obviously not everybody like that but i saw a very clear example where the boss was bullying constantly bullying the employee and then i saw the boss interact with his boss and it was exactly the same he was getting cut down constantly by by his boss so that my very small sample set sort of supported the the uh, the the Malcolm Gladwell uh, assertion. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we have one more question from Mohsen. Thanks a lot for the interesting talk. I wonder if you are, um, if you see similar cognitive bias in mining companies' attitude towards ESG promises that they make and, the, and their efforts to achieve their goals. Yeah, I mean, and this is not, this is not, isolated to mining, like I'm sure exact, all these same cognitive biases are affecting construction projects, hydroelectric projects, like everything out there. Um, ESG is, is even more complicated because it's even more in, in, the, uh, in the human interaction. So there's, there's always a power, a power balance and, and people uh, are not necessarily fully exposed to what the risks and the expectations are. Uh, and it goes both ways too, right? The, the expectations of, of, uh, of the communities, if there's not a good communication in both directions, then, then it can be very detrimental. But yeah, absolutely. There's, there's I'm sure if, if you're very deeply in ESG, I'm sure you can go through uh, Wikipedia and, and identify your top 10 things that are, that are detrimental to the industry in that, in that line, for sure. Yes, thank you. So back to the audience. <laughs> uh, yeah, hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm actually struggling a bit with some of it. So you sort of use this word cognitive and yet when I hear the sort of um, examples you give, I think that people are doing it deliberately. Um, so, and I can't tell the difference. So do you get my question as it is, or do I need to explain it further? But how do you determine, no, I, you get it? No, no, I understand. I, I understand what you're, what you're going towards. And, and the, the problems that I'm describing are so, uh, intrinsic in, in a, in a, in a very large number of companies that, I don't think it's possible that this many humans are actively looking to deceive and gain from from deceiving uh, investors or populations or anything. Uh, I've been in I've been in, in various positions within this this power structure, and people are lying to themselves more than they are to 
to the investors or whatever. Like the, the managers that have that are flogging their projects and they think it's it's a winner. Maybe they have small small uh, uncertainties, but generally speaking, they believe to their core that what they have is is the best thing since sliced bread. And if anybody speaks ill of their project and thinks they have weaknesses, those people are probably wrong. So definitely there's there's some shysters in the industry. There's people that are out there to cheat and steal. Uh, but I think the vast majority of people are are good people that are, are trying to do well uh, and are maybe in a position in a position of weakness in their relationships with with the supervisors, with the managers, with the clients. Uh, and are just trying to to find a way to navigate that and and make it make sense in their mind that that it's okay what they're doing it's just small pieces of, of a bigger picture and if if something happens it's, it can't be their fault and that's the thing is like all these risks are subdivided in these different experts right so no single person feels like oh this is i'm doing this thing like the the the, the person who did the variogram does not think that they can possibly make a four hundred million dollar investment fail, but they that person played a small role in that in that whole debacle. Yeah. Now that regulators request climate related disclosure, we will likely see additional examples to add to your PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. So, will your presentation be made available to those registered? So, I think I think it's going to be published on the video here. You can Correct. Confirm that. So you can come back to it. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> climate-related disclosure is interesting. Uh, um, we, uh, yeah, there's all the different levels of scope one, scope two, scope three. You know, does does Rio Tinto are they going to take responsibility for their their iron that goes into building a cruise ship, which is going to burn diesel in the future? It's uh, it's we're going into a weird weird environment where it's hard to, to to trace all these things but yeah interesting question Ooh, and one more um so yeah we probably have time for one more um question um thanks for the talk for, um, this one is from juliana segura salazar as a colombian and woman i can say that authority bias and mining is related to the authority figure and also gender aspects as probably happen in other countries and sectors absolutely uh my 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 wife is a, is also a, a geologist and and you know we uh we discuss openly about about all these different uh gender aspects and it's uh there's definitely a lot of subtle and often not very subtle things that that occur in the industry and a lot of different industries um uh, in terms of how uh how people with different different gender and different ethnicities are, are treated uh, absolutely thank you so much Guy. we're probably uh reaching um, the, the the time limit of our um, seminar. Um, thank you for the straight up talk. <laughs> you <laughs> sort of called it as uh, as it is and uh, very refreshing. So thank you for joining us. Um, unless we have one more question in the audience, audience is quiet. Um, Rick is saying great presentation and discussion, very thought provoking indeed. Um, so next week on June 3rd, we will be back at the lecture theater uh, with an in-person presentation. Uh, and this one will be from Dr. Mehdi Sirati from the Department of Civil Engineering here at UQ. Um, so that's a rescheduled uh, presentation from um, a few weeks back when he canceled on us last minute <laughs> due to illness. Uh, but um, he will be presenting on the tensile fracturing of hard and brittle solids. So completely different uh, direction once again. And uh, we will see you all then. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.